Our next presenter is Deepika Bodapati from a small science workshop in San Jose, California. So many of you are probably aware of the E. coli and salmonella scare a few years ago, where people were eating contaminated salad and getting very sick because of it. Um, now, when I was addressing this problem of contamination in foods, I thought that if I could stop the problem at the source, uh, we wouldn't have this problem of contamination. However, as I began to list the sources, I found that there were too many and that it would be impractical to monitor each and every one. That it wasn't about stopping the problem at the source. It was about detecting the problem right before we ate the food, from a consumer point of view, using a home test kit. Now, as I stated before, E. coli and salmonella were the main players in this contamination within food. Now, E. coli and salmonella are both examples of gram-negative bacteria. Now, what is gram-negative bacteria? The main difference between gram-negative bacteria and gram-positive bacteria is that gram-negative bacteria actually has a toxin within its cell walls. And when this bacteria breaks down, this toxin remains. This is what we know as endotoxin. When we eat the food, this toxin is what makes us sick. So in my case, I would be trying to detect this endotoxin. So in the pharmaceutical industry, they actually have a problem with endotoxin contamination. They actually uh, use a test called an LAL test to detect endotoxin in uh, pumps and syringes. LAL stands for Limulus Amebocyte Lysate. Now, what this LAL is, is that it's actually an extract from the blood of a horseshoe crab. And this extract will either change color or cloud up or clot in the presence of endotoxin. Now, the problem with this test in a home environment is that it requires specialized equipment. Even analyzing the data requires very special equipment. Impossible in a home environment. So the main difference between an industry test and a home test is that in the industry, they want to detect precise levels of endotoxin. At home, we just want to know if we can eat our salad or not, safe or unsafe. It's very similar to a pregnancy test. <laughs> um, so, during my experimentation, I did actually try uh, various tests. Um, as you can see on top, I tried the gel clot test. Now, how this test works is that it actually clots in the presence of endotoxin. Now, I actually rejected this because I found that the clot broke very easily. I also tried to make a packaging of this clot with, out of sodium alginate, and I actually found that the sodium alginate packaging also broke very easily. So I rejected that. Um, you may notice that I don't have a turbidity test up here, an LAL turbidity test, where the LAL clouds up in the presence of endotoxin. I didn't try that test because my lab itself did not have the equipment to analyze the data at the time. So if the, my lab couldn't do it, our homes could definitely not do it. Um, then I moved on to the chromogenic test. Now, how this chromogenic test works is that the LAL actually works with a chromogenic substrate, which is essentially a dye. And these two work together to change color in the presence of endotoxin. Now, it did change color in the presence of endotoxin. However, I had to actually modify the procedures to pick up the threshold of endotoxin that I wanted to detect for my purposes. Now, this is just a condensed version of what the pharmaceutical recommended procedure as you can see here, you first have to add water, endotoxin, LAL, put it in the incubator for 10 minutes, take it out, add chromogenic substrate, put it in the incubator for 16 minutes, take it out, add a stopping reagent, and then put it through a photospectrometer, and then you can read your results. Um, obviously, this is a very, very, uh, very intense procedure that cannot be done at home. So when I was visualizing my test, I actually was thinking of something along the lines of a litmus test, where it would work similar to a dipstick test. Now, when engineering my test, I actually did set a set of goals for myself to meet as I went on with my experimentation. My first goal was my test had to be able to show quick results. Now, how I did this was I tried different types of filter paper with the LAL test, and whichever one worked the fastest was used for the remainder of my experiment. I found that the Wattman qualitative filter paper worked the best. 
Uh, therefore, it was used for the remainder of my experiment. It worked within 35 seconds. So my next goal was actually determining a color graduation scale. Now, what this means is I wanted to know if the amount of endotoxin detected actually corresponded to a color that was being changed. Um, I found that this actually was the case. I did a dilution series to do this, so I found that the more endotoxin detected, the darker the color change, and the less endotoxin detected, the lighter the color change. Now, I wanted to make sure that my test was easy to use. How I envisioned the consumer using this test, it was um, they take a few leaves of their salad, they'd mix it with some water, they dip their chemically treated paper into the water, and corresponding to a color change, you know whether or not you can eat your salad. Now, again, very similar to a litmus test. However, how I designed this test was, it was actually a result of a problem that I actually had. I'll build up on that later on in my experiment. But how I envisioned my test and how I created it was that I had two spots, a spot for the LAL and a spot for the chromogenic substrate, which is the dye. And the consumer would add this to their uh, salad water, essentially creating a bridge between the two spots with the water. Therefore, they would meet and there would be a color change if endotoxin was present. Now, I wanted to have a negative control embedded in my test. You may notice that I don't have a positive control embedded in the test. Um, in my case, a positive control would be making sure that the LAL and the chromogenic substrate, which is the dye, actually changed color in the presence of endotoxin. Now, the reason I don't have that is because it's something I'm actually working on now. Um, the challenge was that I had to find a way to safely package and embed that endotoxin into the test strip and safely distribute it. So that's something that I'm even working on now in terms of engineering. However, for my purposes now, I'm working on a negative control that I actually embedded into the test. Now, what a negative control does is it makes sure that the LAL test is not changing color with just airborne endotoxin. It's only changing color if there's endotoxin present in the salad water. So essentially, this is what a prototype of my test would look like. On this side of the test, on the, uh, sorry, <laughs> on this side of the, on the bottom side of the test, uh, you can actually see that you have the chromogenic substrate and the LAL separate from each other. Now, how the consumer would use this negative control portion is that they would just take their regular tap water and dip this this side of the test into the tap water. Again, similar concept, creating a bridge between the two spots. And if there's, a, if there's endotoxin present, there will be a color change. Now, I've actually found that there's always been minimal amounts of endotoxin present. So there's always some color change. However, it wouldn't be about if there was a color change or not. It would be if there was, if there was a color change darker than a certain color, then you wouldn't eat your salad. So you know that if for your negative control, if it doesn't change a dark color, you know that your test is working, and now you can move on with your actual test. Again, the consumer would take their salad water, dip the test into their salad water, eventually, essentially creating a, a bridge between the two spots, ending up in a color change if endotoxin is present. Now I wanted to make sure that my test was able to work in a variety of temperatures. Uh, I don't know when, when this test is going to be used or where it should be used, so I wanted to make sure that it just worked at different temperatures. Um, I actually uh, tested it at different temperatures, and I found that it did actually work consistently at different temperatures, and uh, further validating my results were my negative controls which did not change color. Now this is just a brief summary of the data that I collected during my experimentation. Uh, the goals that I set for myself at the beginning of my experiment were I showed quick results, there was a color graduation scale, it was easy to use, uh, I had a negative control embedded in the test, and it also worked at a variety of home temperatures. Now, uh, though I had many problems during my experiment, uh, these, were the two, these are the two that I'm going to highlight right now. Um, determining the right amount of LAL um, was actually a difficulty for me because in the manufacturing industry and in the pharmaceutical industry, they want to detect even the tracest amounts of endotoxin. So for me, it was a process of diluting and experimenting, diluting and experimenting to find a threshold of endotoxin that I actually wanted to detect for my purposes. Also, I had a problem with uh, getting these false positives. Uh, I actually found out that 
the LAL and the chromogenic substrate actually react with one another after a period of two hours, even if there's no endotoxin present. Now, um, this actually happened, this wasn't expected because in the pharmaceutical recommended procedure, they had a stopping reagent after they took their test. So they didn't have to worry about that. However, I didn't have the luxury of having a stopping reagent. So that was something that I worked with, uh, that I actually engineered my test with the two spots separate from each other. Uh, that way the spots would only join right before the consumer used the test, right before they ate their cell. So that's how I overcame that problem. Now, uh, this is just a prototype of something that I'd like to further develop in the future. Uh, researching other types of practical packaging for this test kit. Uh, right now, I have something similar to a litmus test or a dipstick test. So maybe if I could make it somewhat like a saran wrap or in the stores, you know, embed it right in the plastic bag that our salad's in. Uh, that way, uh, it would just be a novel type of packaging. Also, looking for other uses this test may have. I know that in third world countries, E. coli and salmonella is a constant in their water. So maybe uh, using this test and applying it to the third world countries to test the contamination of their water. Also, creating a test that will guarantee no false positives and no false negatives. Now, as you know, I've already embedded a negative control in my test. Now it's about embedding that positive control and making sure that both of these stay consistent and accurate. Now, I would like to acknowledge the Schmall Science Workshop, Sarah Thaler, Sarah Perry, for giving me the environment that uh, I worked in. Also, I'd like to thank my mother for being my chauffeur. So, thank you. <laughs>
what is the success rate of my test? Now, I actually found that my test uh, did work in all the procedures that I tested. Uh, this is only after I modified the procedures that the pharmaceutical company gave me because I was getting constant false positives at that point because it was detecting very trace amounts of endotoxin. And in our households, there is trace amounts of endotoxin everywhere. So that's, um, I diluted it and experimented to find what I wanted to detect. But after I modified the procedure, I found that I had a pretty much 100% success rate with my test. Yes, sir. Do you have any cases of corrective test strips? I'm sure the concern is maybe it's ambiguous if you have to swallow the swallow and the two bleed into each other. Is it really unambiguous if you have a single color swallow or a single color swallow? Oh, okay. So um, she, she was asking, if the, it would be ambigu ambiguous if I had these two spots. Um, however, how the, how the test worked was when you added it, when you just dipped it in the water, they would meet at some point, and wherever it met, there would be a distinct color change. And depending on that color change, you'd know with your uh, color graduation scale whether or not you could eat it. But it wasn't just in one spot, and it wasn't just in another. It was with, at, during the bridge, at the spot where the two met. Additional questions, yes sir. How would you propose to uh, detect sort of single point contamination within a head of lettuce or something? Single? The whole thing, or are you going to have to put all the <laughs> things for that? Okay, so um, for my purpose, okay, I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, he was asking about if I had to put the entire salad through a bath to test the contamination. Well, um, you, you could do that, but for my purposes, uh, I found that you should take it at the center of the salad, the salad stock, you take it at the center, take a few leaves out, you don't need to drench the entire, you can do that, but <laughs> just take the center few leaves. Uh, mix it with the water, a given amount of water, just to make sure you don't completely dilute the endotoxin levels. And um, at that point, you can see uh, how much endotoxin. Yes, sir. For those of us who make salads, do we care about the center leaves or the outer leaves? Oh, <laughs> um, from the, okay, so his question was, <laughs> if you care about the center leaves or the outer leaves. Now, with my experimentation, I actually did this project a few years ago, um, I found that you want to look at the center leaves because uh, those, those are, are the ones that usually have the endotoxin surrounding it because when you're putting the manure in it, uh, in the ground, those center leaves come in contact with it and that's where the fecal matter, the E. coli, the salmonella come from. So that's the biggest point of contamination. So you probably don't want to know the least amount of contamination, you want to know the most amount. So you should take them. Thank you. Thank you very much.